our sesquicentennial, and you know, I'm really excited tonight because we are in the presence of greatness. I will not um, steal Dr. Muhammad's thunder in introducing everyone, but you know, just as a point of personal privilege, uh, I followed this gentleman when President Obama was in office because I don't know if all of you remember or not, there was a national campaign, Every Kid in a Park. And um, that was something that uh, I thought was very uh, instructive uh, because it had a strategic focus, to say the least. Um, and I'll, he, I'll let him talk about that, but I really appreciated that. And for those of you who don't know, my name is Ramon Manning. Um, I'm the board of Conservancy, and I'm honored to uh, be here with you tonight, and I just want to acknowledge our board secretary, Valerie Coleman, is here. And, you know, everybody, I think, is still um, really just reveling in the excitement of listening to Ms. Bostic and others, you know, from the other night, and, uh, you know, it was truly, truly a pleasure. Before I sit down, um, I just wanted to talk about, really quickly, uh, why we're doing this kind of uh, programming. And I think it was important to note that, you know, we're celebrating a momentous occasion in 150 years. Not many people can say 150 years. And what was important to the board and to everyone here at Emancipation Park is that while we're celebrating this momentous occasion, we also bring programming from an educational perspective that really reflects why we're here. Um, and I think tonight speaks to that. Um, and with that, I will get out of the way and sit down, but I just wanted to tell you all personally, thank you for being here. Um, this is a great, great um, panel discussion. Um, and I'm looking forward to it. So without further ado, I'll bring up Interim Executive Director here at Emancipation Park, Dr. Muhammad. Thank you, Chairman Manning. Uh, thank you to everyone who's here uh, in the audience, as well as those who are present via our live stream and will be watching this uh, later on socials, including uh, YouTube uh, and Instagram. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing uh, our moderator uh, for this evening, who will then in turn introduce uh, my friend and special guest here, Dr. Stanton. So, Algenita Davis uh, is a native Houstonian uh, from the fifth ward, I was going to earn her undergraduate degree in accounting from Howard University. Go HU! <laughs> All right. <laughs> and then attended Howard's Law School, uh, earning her doctorate of jurisprudence. Her legal career spans over 40 years, during which she served as a tax attorney for Shell Oil Company and as general counsel of the Port of Houston Authority. Her leadership in the legal profession includes past presidency of the National Bar Association and Houston Lawyers Association and board membership of the State Bar of Texas. Moving from law to community engagement, Algenita joined Texas Commerce Bank in 1989 and served as Senior Vice President and Community Affairs Officer, continuing in this role at TCB's successor, J.P. Morgan Chase and Company. In 1996, she helped found the William A. Lawson Institute for Peace and Prosperity, was its first board president and became a visiting professor at TSU School of Public Affairs, School of Business, and Thurgood Marshall School of Law. From 2006 to 2013, she was the executive director of the Houston Habitat for Humanity, constructing 350 houses, building three complete subdivisions, and coordinating many renovations for seniors. Algenita is a former 27-year member of the City of Houston Planning Commission, appointed by six mayors, Chair of the Houston Area Urban League, Vice President of Harris County Hospital District Foundation, and a board member of Houston Business Development Incorporated. She has served as Chair of the Tax Increment Reinvestment Zone Number 9, Vice Chair of Service Number 7, and was Founding Chair of the Houston Downtown Management Corporation. So with that very illustrious bio, please join me in welcoming our moderator, Ms. Algina Davis. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you so much. I um, I'm sitting here with this microphone piece of I think it's come off from wherever it's supposed to be. This is truly an honor for me. You are attending the most important event of this celebration. And let me tell you why. Because we have somebody here that no one else in the world has this level of experience with parks. Our special guest, and we will have a great time visiting him, right. is none other than Mr. Robert G. Stanton. And let me tell you about him. When President Clinton got ready to determine who from the diverse community would best represent the leadership of the national parks, he had to think about who would be the person with the experience. Nobody. Nobody in the world, anywhere, came with this experience. Let me just give you an example. This gentleman was a park ranger, a park management assistant, a superintendent, a deputy regional director, a regional director, an assistant director for operations, an associate director for management and operations, all before he became the director of the National Park Service. He was confirmed unanimously, and that is why, because nobody in the world had his experience. Nobody in the world would have this level of competence, understanding of the organization that controls 384 sites around this nation, other than Robert G. Stanton. Not only... <laughs> was he honored and unanimously confirmed in the Clinton administration. With President Obama, he was appointed in 2014 as the director as the, on the Advisory Council of Historic Preservation, an independent federal agency where he served for six years. His background in parks and historic preservation is simply incomparable. We needed him here in Houston a long time <laughs> because we have the park that is historic, the park that demonstrates the culture and the importance and the significance of the concept of freedom right here. This gentleman is associated, I'm just going to give you a few places where he has awards, a Distinguished Service Award from the U.S. Department of Interior, the Distinguished Service Award from the National Council of Negro Women, you know that's a rough one, yeah. <laughs> the Founders Award for the Student Conservation Association, the Colonel Charles Young Diversity Recognition Award, the National Park Foundation, the Living Legacy Award for the Association of the Study of African American Life and History, how about that? The Louis D. DuPont Crowned Shield Award for the National Trust for Historic Foundation. And we've been praying for them to send some money from, to Houston. So we have somebody here who has all of the background, all of the experience, understands the necessity of parks, understands how significant his role has been and the roles of parks has been in historic preservation. And I would like you to give a round, a resounding welcome to Robert G. E. Stanton. <laughs> so it's real easy for us to start our conversation with him. Basically, he's going to tell you why he's here and why the Emancipation Park ranks high enough to get his attention. Thank you very much. Uh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen and friends. I uh, must tell you, I am humbled, pleased, and overjoyed with that very gracious introduction. I, uh, I'm a native son of Texas, Tarrant County, 
and I've often touted that uh, Fort Worth was the leading city in the state, but now I think it's uh, Houston. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, certainly owe a great deal of uh, thanks to uh, Chairman Manning and certainly my uh, good friend of long standing Manning for extending me this very warm uh, invitation to be with you. And they said, Bob, yes, it will be a warm invitation, but I didn't think they'd be going overboard. <laughs> <laughs> But to be here at uh, Emancipation Park uh, is a privilege. A uh, park uh, founded uh, by our ancestors in 1872. And uh, it's hard to reflect on what that, that means. And I was here last evening, and to hear Mrs. Bostic. Uh, yes. I, I tell you, folks, Mr. Priest, her philosophy and uh, her continuing commitment uh, to preserving our collective heritage. I, I should just uh, go full disclosure uh, that I believe it's her sister, uh, Sammy, uh, who gave me much and all the treatment there in Washington, D.C. And I spent <laughs> with her two hours ago. What was it? Uh, Emancipation Park, 1872. What is so interesting is that was the same year that as a nation of people, we established the first national park in the world, Yellowstone National Park. So uh, Emancipation Park and Yellowstone are born the first, born together in the same year. But, uh, and I know that you have a series of other questions and certainly want to entertain some comments from the audience, but Emancipation Park, uh, just by the fact that it still exists, uh, represented a commitment by those who understand the importance and the sacrifices that uh, that uh, Reverend Yates and, and, and many of his colleagues made and sacrificing financially to, to do this, to uh, acquire 10 acres for, for $800. You can imagine what the value of this place is today in terms of our monetary system. But to have that kind of vision that kind of uh, understanding that the people need a place to come to, and to be on common ground, to share experiences, to reflect on the celebration of emancipation and recognizing that this place could continue to serve as a source of pride and inspiration and where you can come together as a community, irrespective of your economic background, or your uh, religious uh, orientation, whatever the case may be. Here, everyone was at home. They could come together as a community. And that is a message, and that is a symbol that Emancipation Park uh, has presented not only to the people of Houston or to the people of Texas, but to the nation that it can be done and follow the example of Emancipation Park. And I think Yellowstone is following the example of Emancipation Park. So I just want to salute all our ancestors who contributed and made it possible for us to be here today to uh, continue to support their vision and their hope that will continue to grow as a community and as a people. Why do you think that parks were identified as a place of dedication? Why do you think that that came about? You've seen the, the whole yeah. process and studied the history. Yeah, the, uh, the orientation, if you will, or the uh, perspectives about parks early on was primarily to preserve the natural scenic wonders. And so if you were to take a look at the number of parks that had been established by Congress from 1872 up until, until maybe the 30s and 40s, they were primarily in the West, large natural areas, Yellowstone, Grand Teton, Grand Canyon, Sequoia, Yosemite, what have you. And it was later on uh, that through the vision uh, the second director of the National Park Service, a fellow by the name of uh, Horace Albright, he felt that uh, perhaps the parks could be expanded to represent and preserve our collective cultural heritage. And he made an argument to the Secretary of the Interior at that time, who, who said that Horace, uh, and this is a little bit above my pay watch, my, my pay grade in terms of incorporating new responsibilities, uh, maybe you should take it to the President of the United States who was considering a major reorganization of the executive branch, was Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And he bought into the idea that, well, yes, 
uh, that, that, that the park serves a so much greater role in preserving our cultural heritage in addition to the large natural area. So once the President Roosevelt signed a, a bill into law, the Park Service immediately had responsibilities for sites that uh, preserve uh, the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, the Civil War, and uh, Statue of Liberty came into the Park Service. Uh, the Monuments Memorial in Washington, D.C., that was being administered directly out of the White House, came into the National Park Service. So overnight, the Park Service expanded this role in terms of uh, our cultural heritage as well as the natural area. And today, the Park Service administers 424 areas um, from America, Samoa to Maine, from Alaska to the U.S. Virgin Island, and certainly include the Monument Memorial in Washington, D.C. And three fourths of that 424 areas speak to us as a people of the nation, talking about our culture, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And there's a lot of ugly stories that have to be told, but they have to be told. Hope that we will learn from them. Yeah. What do you think, how do you think the relationship between the National Park Service, state parks, mm -hmm. and local parks, how was that relationship developed over the, over the uh, history of the Park Service? Because there is that coordinated relationship. Yes, it is. Yeah. We like to think there is a seamless uh, thread uh, that connects the local or municipal parks to the state parks, the state parks to the federal parks, and even today, the international parks. Uh, but one would take a look at uh, a park such as uh, Emancipation Park, recognizing that it had provided a place of learning in terms of park management and preservation, even before the federal government really got uh, uh, into a full swing of it. But to a large degree, once the federal government assumed a greater role in managing parks, it also brought a certain level of expertise. And, uh, and even today, that is the case. Many of the park specialists, could be a biologist or a historical architect, lend their expertise to state, states to a local government, what have you. And what people have come to agree upon, whether it's a park such as the Emancipation Park, a Greenway Park, and uh, in Fort Worth or uh, Central Park in New York or Grand Canyon National Park, there's two things that, that drive the park, two things. One is that you have a responsibility to preserve the resources in the park, whereas the natural resources of this building, it has to be preserved. People have to do maintenance, and maintenance is the key to, to sustainability, as you well know. And then have to assure that those resources are accessible to all the people. To all the people, and certainly with the, those with disabilities, who have, they have a right to visit and to be able to access the facilities. So preserving the parks, the maintenance, rehabilitation, restoration, what have you, is key. But also provide opportunities for the people to enjoy the resources. And uh, sometimes it's difficult to do both of them because some people are not uh, visitors, are not as careful in terms of how they utilize the resources. Parks there, state parks and local parks, uh, you know, uh, caught up many times with the people being disrespectful, leaving debris, you know, graffiti, crap, what have you, and how do you balance? You just can't close it off to people because you want them to enjoy it. But sometimes human behavior is <laughs> so bewildering. It really is. It's a challenge. It's a challenge. It's a challenge. With reference to that preservation and maintenance role, yes. This park, for example, was a designated project of, I believe it's called the Public Works yeah, Project yeah. back in the 1930s. Right, and so. then you also had the Civilian Conservation Corps. Right. In area too. How is that prioritized? How does a local park like this, I remember seeing a picture of uh, the, a state legislator, uh, Cersei Bracewell, my father-in-law, Dr. Davis, and those folks who were here yeah. in 1939 when most of this was constructed as a part of the stimulus package oh, as a result of that. Yes. How is that prioritized? And how, how do we make sure that we keep this park at that a visible level yes. of priority with the federal government? Okay. Uh, one has to understand the social political environment in which uh, we uh, operate. And when I say we, that's collectively in terms of citizens, 
work within the framework of the government. Uh, and uh, <laughs> I'm going to be a, a little tactical here to the extent that I can. Uh, we all operate in somewhat of a competitive basis. Uh, and if the person who uh, has some uh, legislative responsibilities here uh, or uh, governmental responsibilities, they have certain resources, certain authority they can exercise. But if, uh, if this park is a part of a greater system, which would be the Houston in the park Recreation system. Park, yes. that department has a number of other parks. So how do you make your argument to the head that, you know, I want my fair share of the annual budget? Bridge. <laughs> <laughs> you got to be prepared to yes. argue for that. Yes. And, and that's the arena in which decisions are made. And certainly if the elected official we have represented here, we may have just a drop of that on the, on the director. And I say, you know, uh, <laughs> we're not getting what we deserve. And, uh, and, 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 and that is critically important at the national level. So the director now has responsibility for those uh, uh, 400 plus areas spread over 80 million acres of land. Every park has competed against the other park. I mean, Yellowstone budget, they make the argument for Yellowstone increases, and then the director has to look at that. Well, what is the superintendent of Martin Luther King Historic Site saying? That person has to make the decision as to how he's or she is going to divide up the budget and then get concurrent by the Secretary of State. That is a competitive process. And uh, a lot of people have interest in what your priorities are. Uh, and uh, for the National Park Service, they will be at the state level too. If a member of uh, Congress, particularly if a member of Congress is on the Appropriation Committee, you uh, have a tendency to listen to them. <laughs> but that, that, that's the argument. So what I would just suggest to, in terms of Emancipation Park being competitive for public funds as administered by the department, and that person may have to go to the mayor or the, or the council, is that you do your best job, and that is what you argue, that you're serving the public, you maintain the facility, and giving a few more dollars, I can do an even better job. But if your track record is poor, you don't come out to well in the budget process. And I'm just sharing that up front. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You have to be competitive, and you can be competitive with the job that you're doing. As we have watched our process for the preservation and maintenance of this particular yes, track, yes. we know that in 1916, uh, this uh, park was acquired by the city of Houston because of a lawsuit was developed. It was a long process. The people of this, uh, the purchasers of the park, and then later the Colored Festival of Emancipation Association. Yes. They fought valiantly through by borrowing money, by doing those things. The older folks, of course, didn't want to borrow. No, no, no. Really. But, <laughs> but the young folks did. Yeah. And there was a, a lean on it, and it was repossessed, and it was, we went through mm -hmm. a lot of, of difficulties. And ultimately, the Colored Festival and Emancipation Association was sued. One, one that were sued because um, it was explained that African Americans had no right to pur to purchase property. That's number one. Oh. That was the first phase of the lawsuit. So that by 1872, purchase was challenged. <laughs> and subsequently, as the uh, individuals tried to do things to maintain the park and craft facilities for the park, they encountered that the par park, of course, was a private yes, entity. Right. So it accumulated taxes, and by eight, the late 1800s, they had debt, and they had these issues and the liens and all of that. So they were involved in them. The individuals who were so determined, they were just brilliant yeah. in terms of the ownership and main, struggling to maintain its ownership. And what we saw was then the city, the judge ruled that because the defendants had sense enough to disband themselves, and so there was no defendant to enforce the lien, they were able to then, the court ruled that this property was going to be devoted for the enjoyment and the celebration of freedom yes. by the colored citizens of Houston and Harris County. 
they were very, very smart at doing that. And then the city then stepped up, paid the bills, and then acquired the ownership of this of the of this particular track in 1960. So there was a process that happened, but it was a valiant legal fight that occurred even back then yes. to, to for this property. So this and I wanted to share that with you because this is sacred ground. Yes, yes. This is not only property that was the the vision of Reverend Yates, yes, Reverend right. Dibble, Richard Brock, and um, yeah. Allen, Richard Allen. They're, I mean, not only did they have it, but those hundreds of people who actually put the money together yes, right. to buy it, and all those people who signed it. And so, because of the specialness of this particular location, how can we use that, that background and that struggle to heighten the significance of this park on a national level. How can what what should we be doing here yeah. as as citizens? We know that it's, okay, it's owned by the city, blah, 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 yeah. and there's a parks board. We know that. But what else should we be doing to heighten it? Because we, this is special. It this is, park it is, is it special, is. and we we need to yeah. figure out yeah. how to get a lot more attention and a lot yeah, more resources for us. There, there, there is something magical about it. Yes. The Emancipation Park and, and just reading the history and the uh, information contained in the website. Very uplifting to me personally. As a native son, having grown up in segregated Texas and you know the standing pains of the doctors separate for the evil and what have you and still know that this resource was here. Uh, as a preface to, uh, to, 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 to a fuller answer to your question, I am very pleased to see that uh, uh, Emancipation Park has been recognized uh, as a place of memory by uh, UNESCO. Uh, I read the, uh, the language of the uh, state historical mark and what have you. But I was surprised, quite candidly, that uh, the park has not been listed on the National Registry of Historic Places. Uh, I don't know whether there's some background as to why that has not been done. Or at least uh, had, uh, any application to me. And I would encourage, and I'll be chatting with the Mohammed and with uh, Chairman Manning as to, uh, I will lend them my support in the way I can in terms of having, having that high level of recognition. Right. And, and what it does, quite candidly, having been inside <laughs> the, the system, is that more recognition you can get at the local, state, and the national level, they give you somewhat of a competitive edge in terms of uh, federal grants that are available. And I might just add that if you were to take a look at the Park Service budget for the past 10, 15, 20 years, it sort of mirrored the, uh, the change in uh, the face of Congress because there are more of us in Congress in terms of the Commission by Caucus and Andrew. So what they have been advocating for is that uh, if there is a resource such as Emancipation Park that may need a little help, or if there's some community based uh, organization that's in preservation, the uh, Department of Education, what have you, there should be some resources for which they can compete for. And if you were to go on uh, the NPS uh, uh, website, you will see an array of grants that are available to parks such as this. But if you can demonstrate that, yes, this park has a long history, it has a quality operation, plus it's on the National Register of Historic Places, that gives you a little bit of an edge in terms of grants. And, and I would just uh, encourage uh, the community here and uh, certainly the leadership of the park uh, to look at ways in which we can bring to uh, not only Houston leadership attention or the state, but the federal attention. And uh, that's where the system works. We, and I would just encourage that. We've been fortunate at Emancipation Park to have a, uh, a significant commitment from our state legislature. Yes, so that's true. It was the decision of a state legislator to support um, this last redevelopment. Yes. It was Representative Garnett Coleman who decided that this was definitely to be a location of the state representative. At the time, our mayor, Sylvester Turner, yes. was able to get some state legislation to you know, actually forward money here. Um, so we have that state recognition within our legislators, 
I don't know where we are administratively. I'm scared. I'm scared. But we, what else can we do to dramatize our current urban need for this park? Yeah. This park fulfills a tremendous need yes. for this particular community. Yes. It has a, a historic background in terms of the folks here. I mean, it's we don't have any mountains to take a look at or any things to, to watch. But when you talk to people who've been in this community, yeah. uh, who talk to Mrs. Bostic, you yeah. had the privilege of yeah. talking with her mom about this one. I mean, when you talk to them, they refer to its action with the current community. How can we use its role currently yeah. to better present the story of our park? Okay, appreciate it very much. I believe that we are honored uh, this evening uh, with uh, the national president uh, of ASALA, the Association of Study Afro-American Life. Mr. Delaney here. Stand, please. The president, the national president. <laughs> Yes. 
So that's why you see the ballpark. That's why you see the, the porches and the chairs. That's why you see the big part of it dealing with the athletic and the, yeah. um, the health facility part of it. That's why you see the redesign of the swimming pool so that it's not it's not the way we used to where we could really learn to swim at 10 feet anymore. <laughs> but it's, it's more yeah. Yeah. But it is designed specifically to address the needs of this community. Yes. What impact does that have on, and what restraints would that have on us as we reached out for resources? Because it's designed for this community. Yeah. Uh, that's a challenge. You can't have a public park that's so dedicated to a certain geographical area. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I'm going to come back to Emancipation Park, and I live out of the state, but this is a public park, and if, you, if, if, if that is the intent, then you would hope that everyone can use. But you apply the needs of the community as maybe the primary focus, but understanding that there will be people coming in who may not have had that long-term association with but if you can demonstrate, if you can demonstrate that at a minimum you're going to do the very best to serve the local community, and then you broaden out from that. And, uh, and, and, and what that argues too is that the local community would have to attest that their interests and needs are being served, and uh, you're not focused on trying to serve a larger audience. So this is a balancing act. And uh, just take that as an example. In the, in in the nation's capital, Washington, D.C., that you're very familiar with. Is that the eighth, the real eighth, or the other eighth, the Hampton? No. no. <laughs> I said, I'm just reading the last question. But it was. I You know. It is that, is that, is that, they do, I said, the regional director for the National Capital Region for eight years. So you here you have Anacostia Park, Rock Creek Park, in the in the city limits of uh, the city limits of uh, DC. So you have a major ongoing daily use of those parks by people who live there or within communities. But by the same token, you may have people come from Boise, Idaho, or from Houston, Texas, to see Anacostia Park or Rock Creek Park. So you balance the local needs who see your park every day as well as the visitors who may just come there once in a lifetime. And it's a challenge. But the key here, I think, is making sure that the people who are in and out of the park every day is that they will go before the assembly of the governor and say, that is my park. It is serving my need. And we'd like to have other visitors, but my needs are being served here. So you've got to have kind of testimony to, uh, to make your argument. How valuable is it to focus on restoring the park naturally. Um, my mother described this park, and when, when they would come here, they would walk from Fifth Ward here to uh, the Juneteenth celebrations as a park with a lot of trees. It was heavily forested. Um, how valuable is it that measures are taken to try to restore it naturally yes, to right. what the way it was natural. Yeah. Parks, by definition, by definition, should be exemplary in terms of the representation and the preservation of our natural and cultural heritage. Even though the scale of the uh, body community here, the trees, roughly, like maybe rabbits as well, what have you, is that their habitat has to be preserved. There has to be a respect for other species that inhabit the earth, even though they may be small. So how you maintain the landscape, how you maintain the shrubbery, the beautiful trees, that should be somewhat of a standard or example that can be replicated. When I go home, I would want to take care of my lawn to look like the lawn that's taken care of in the uh, Emancipation Park. Parks should be an example of how we respect and care for our natural environment as well as our culture. And, uh, and that should be a consistent standard of any park, is that it should be exemplary. The other is uh, how we uh, maintain our physical 
surroundings. You would expect to come into this park, not to see debris spread at all. And when I go home, I should not see debris except in my own yard. And this park should be an example of what we call visual quality or the integrity of how you maintain it, uh, the physical properties. And the park stands out as an example to this. And I, I just uh, want to applaud those who are responsible who are maintaining the park. And, uh, and, and that's one of the, one of the, uh, one of the uh, objectives. And uh, I had the pleasure of uh, having uh, the late Dr. John O. Franklin serve as the chairman of the National Park System Advisory Board, which was uh, established by a Congressional Act in 1935. And the major objective of the, of the advisory board was to advise the director of the Park Service and the uh, and Secretary of the Interior and ask John and uh, Dr. Franklin and uh, his team to develop a, a report which make us a job and it's called Rethinking the National Parks for the 21st Century. And what Dr. Franklin and other underscore is that parks of its myriad of activities and functions should serve an educational role. That we learn to respect our natural park. We learn about our history and our heritage and also learn how we can respect ourselves and others. It's an educational resource that should be available. So education is inherent in terms of how we maintain the park, how we provide the public, how we relate to each other. It should be an education experience. We grow from that. Now, that, that's an important part because one of the criticisms that we have with the tourists, okay. uh, one of the criticisms that the tourists got when we worked on the park, we paid a lot of money to preserve large trees and even yes, moved yes. a couple of large trees. And that was one of the things we were attacked about because it's like, why are you paying this money? Right. Houston is a developer city, and sometimes uh, we don't have adequate respect for our trees. Yeah. And when <laughs> we paid all this money, hundreds of thousand dollars to start moving trees, uh, we we had we were criticized, and so that was the reason I asked about that because it's important that there. That's a part of the education it is, process it is, it is, it is. to try to restore yeah. it to where the you know the natural resources yeah. of, of the park. That I, yeah. I appreciate, I appreciate that. that. Let, was, let me just comment a little bit further on this. Uh, it is interesting that uh, sometimes there has to be adversity before we realize some of the mistakes uh, that we're making, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, often the product of. The, 50s, 60s, and 70s, but there were two uh, two major occurrences uh, in uh, the 60s uh, that really propelled us into the environmental awareness age. A uh, native by the name of Rachel Carson, who was an employee of Fish and Wildlife Service in the interior, wrote the book Silent Spring. As you know, we were using herbicides and pesticides, and next thing you know, there's no birds or butterflies or have you. And as a result, uh, that book had a tremendous impact and uh, came out of a lot of uh, environment policies in the 60s. And then a little later on, maybe what, four years, no, six years later, uh, uh, the Conference of Mayors, the American Conference of Mayors, uh, wrote a report called uh, With Heritage So Rich. And that was in response to something that you know so much about was that they said, well, we need to sort of hold back because we are destroying our cultural fabric. And uh, the language of their report, Heritage So Rich, really sort of evolved into a major piece of legislation. So, uh, Bill signed to law by President Johnson in 1966 called the Natural Historic Preservation Act. And interestingly enough, there were two major things that were going on in the 50s and the 60s that frightened a lot of people. And one of the things that was going on uh, was a resource that each of us use almost daily, the interstate house. <laughs> ah. And President Eisenhower, you know, he uh, had served in the World War II. He knew that, uh, learning from the experience, that if we, we God forgive us to see this happen, if we were to be confronted with a war on our ground, how would we mobilize ourselves? How would we transport from New York to Los Angeles, 
and they did not have an interstate highway system then. So he said that we need that, and it was called the Eisenhower Defense System. He eventually became the interstate highway system. But uh, when I was growing up, I did not understand the expression of white highways to black neighborhoods. But if you were to take a look at Fort, take a look at Houston, take a look at any city, the interstate highway system decimated. My first park I ever visited was called Greenway Park in Fort Worth. It started out at 60 acres. There's only 15 usable acres of park because of the Interstate 35. Uh, and what, what, what the law says now, if there's any development that's going to be, that's going to utilize federal funds, even in the existence, if you, look, you have to make an assessment or some determination that the integrity of, 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 of the resource or the impact uh, will be minimized and hopefully uh, it wouldn't occur at all. So when you see a major federal project underway and it is proceeding, hopefully they've done their due diligence and, and that would not, would not happen. But we destroyed so, so much of our cultural heritage and, and safe lands held by American Indians. They said, you know, the highway goes that way that's the way to go. I don't care if that's been sacred or not. I mean, it's a sad chapter in our collective history. And, and things are still happening that are sad. We are right in the middle yeah. Yeah. <laughs> of a major uh, highway improvement project. In fact, our uh, neighborhoods are literally rolling on the floor like, oh, we are just, yeah. the, this, it's major. major. And what has happened in Houston, we have, extreme views, and I'm, I'm one of those views, of the impact of the highway yes. system and what it has done to our neighborhoods. There is no denial that there has been a devastating impact. Uh, I see. My issue is, what are you going to do about it now? Okay. How, huh. how yeah. can the role of the parks, and that's a big battle yeah, right now yeah. with our North Houston Highway project. How will that project utilize those dollars that are, being, are expended to enhance uh, our park system? Yes, yes. That is probably one of the biggest issues and it hinges on the definition of transportation versus the definition of parks. So if you are at odds about whether you can spend money that is transportation money that ends up developing a park, that is our biggest yeah, fight right yeah. now that is going on. And it is completely, my, the last number that I heard was something like $300 million of a site. Like, in Houston, our parks are now a big part of our stormwater water system. Yes, yes. And we are utilizing our stormwater water system to create additional hike and bike trails, additional places for parks. We've created a park, Buffalo Bike Park. Yes. We've created a memorial. All these parks because of our stormwater water system, because we're so flat. And so that is now a very big issue. It's a challenge in Houston, yes. but it deals with the federal definition. So how can we use the need for parks to address the challenges of the highway system? How, how do we do that? Because that's right, that's the big tug of war right now that's happening with our Northeastern Highway Project. Yeah, I think the question I initially raised is uh, who's around the table uh, addressing the issue and uh, are there voices from the community and, and from others who said that there are some values uh, that, uh, that need to be recognized as you're making those critical critical decisions and uh, if, uh, if you're quiet it would maybe convey the notion that you don't care so we'll proceed as we wish. Sometimes we, uh, <laughs> Mr. Douglas said we have to, we have to agitate. Yeah, I'm, 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 the, the parks are not quiet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you need to have voices around the table. I, I don't know all the particulars on it, but, mm -hmm. but, uh, but there has to be some involvement. There has to be some involvement. And to demonstrate the values that 
you know, a lot of the entangled language is so critically important uh, in terms of part of the living your spirit to provide a, a place of solitude, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And people got to, got to come forward and, and express those values, express those interests. And, you know, it's hard decisions have to be made, obviously, in the end. Right. Yeah, 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 right. The parks are, are that's a really big part of the mitigating factors. Yeah, okay, right. And that, that what's, what's really yes. happening, and especially the role that this park plays as part of the Emancipation Heritage Trail yes. and the relationship of this park to Freemanstown and what's happening in, in Freemanstown and reconnecting yes. Freemanstown back to the original. All of that is yeah. happening right now because of the highway system and the yes. challenge as well as the need for parks. So. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're right in the middle yeah. of that. We can and, see that. And you mentioned that Freemantown, they really say they had great tours for one of the pastor, Dr. Roy. And, and uh, I, I tell you, I'm still on cloud nine and uh, enjoyed that visit very much. And also, uh, Bethel first, and then uh, Gregory School. Uh, it's been very uplifting and uh, certainly to be here in the third ward. I see some of my fellow alums from the real age. graduate of Jack Gates High School here in Houston. <laughs> well, well, you know, everybody has to go to high school, so. <laughs> Uh, 
uh, or to make improvement to the existing uh, uh, obtrusive uh, you know, facility that could mitigate uh, uh, that, uh, that kind of uh, impact. And what comes to mind is, is an example that, uh, that a distinguished monitoring you knows. Uh, let's take uh, Interstate 2, 2, uh, 285, right? That, that, that physically separated uh, Anacostia Park, Anacostia River from the Anacostia community without any forethought. So how people going to walk to the river and they put one or two uh, pedestrian over, overpass on it. Now they're going to go back and try to make some mints there. But if there's no outcry by the community that, that we would like to go back to the extent that we can to connect the community that has lost, then the designers are not going to incorporate any mitigated measures into the new design. And uh, it's, it's a question of going on record loudly uh, that let's try to make the best out of a bad situation. And, uh, and sometimes that's easier said than done, quite obviously. Quite obviously. Rima Sound Conservancy has uh, proposed a park structure. I heard that too. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, right. They have, yeah. they have their, their actual neighborhood groups that are working okay. to do that. Yeah, I, I think what's what, Andrew Street, where they have the brick, and it did cut off by the, uh, by the freeway. And that's, that's and to reestablish the connector yeah. between Freedmanstown and Antioch Church yeah. with that connector. Yeah, okay. Uh -huh. Well, let me ask some, I don't know when, uh, is I 45? I 45. When it was constructed, whether or not uh, there were any subsequent improvements to lessen the impact. No. Yeah. Nothing. <laughs> no. 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 I-45 I I started down the street right here yeah. in 1950. That's when they started. Oh. They ripped up this this entire original neighborhood Ooh. where folks live. Then 59 and I-10 came through and they crucified the yeah. war. Then 288 came through. So all of that destruction of the community stuff, yeah. that's all we have. So it's good. It's, the key is now what's going to happen yeah. and how can we use parks as a connector yeah. to reestablish connections yeah. with our community. That's what we really have to work yeah. on. That's a tough one. Another question. Thank you. Yes. I'm loud, so I don't need a mic. Um, just curious, out of all the parks you've seen throughout the nation and the world, um, are there any urban parks or parks specifically in black and historic communities that you think that we should be looking at as a precedent for how to move forward? Are there any uh, great examples you think we should be looking at elsewhere in the nation that we don't know about yet? No, I, I, I can only reference uh, national areas in the urban community, uh, but I'm sure that if you were to go to some of the larger urban centers that have maybe a population similar to Houston, you may find some parks that seemingly are getting their act together or have their act together. Uh, I'm not that personally experienced with all of the local parks, but I will tell you what happened in the senators, and I don't I think it came from congressional delegations in New York and in uh, San Francisco. They said that uh, we have a growing population, a diverse population, and there are some military bases uh, that are being deactivated, uh, and maybe there is a way to use that land base to create parks within the urban centers that people literally could walk to. And uh, so that, uh, that recommendation got full support, and uh, Congress authorized Gateway in New York and Golden Gate in San Francisco, and uh, they proved to be quite successful. So when things are successful, what do you think the congressional delegation from Georgia said? We want one of those too in Atlanta. So you now have Chattanooga, and then people in, uh, in California and Los Angeles said, well, you got that one up in San Francisco, we want one too. You got Santa Monica. And then the people in uh, between Cleveland and Akron said, we like that too. Uh, so you will have Cuyahoga Valley and Park. And these have proven to be extremely successful. Uh, let me just offer a little commentary here, and uh, something I feel very strong about. Uh, 
is that for a period of time, there was somewhat of a you know, rejection on the part of uh, people who had spent long years in the park service. They said, you know, we don't really belong in the urban environment. That's, you know, uh, and, and, and these park members that represented something less than this, what we will call a national area in terms of standards. And, uh, I uh, came up pretty strong, and, uh, and I still hold the belief that if the area has been authorized by an act of Congress, such as Gateway, Golden Gate, or Childhood, or whatever it is, and we put the area here, that is telling the park people, it is telling the public, the international visitors, if the area here is on, if the area is on, then that minister, that youngster up the street should expect and rightfully deserve the same standard of maintenance, protection, resource preservation as if they were in Yellowstone, Grand Canyon, or Tito. And the people say, stand on you. I said, yeah, that's the way it's going to be. If it has an arrogate on it, and we say this is national, it, 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 it does not like any integrity or commitment to preserve. Uh, so I would say here at uh, Emancipation Park, if there are other parks within the, uh, the city system, and some people say, well, you know, it's over there type thing, don't accept it. It has to, you have to adhere to the same high standards, regardless of where it is, if you're sincere about that commitment. And, uh, so if you were to go to some of these parks that in, 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 in the dense population centers, you should expect the same standards. And, uh, and maybe there's something to be learned uh, from Gateway or Golden Gate or Chicago or Chattanooga and Atlanta that could apply here uh, as well. But, I, but I, I, my experience would tell me that you're setting the standards here in the <laughs> national park that you learn from here. I mean, to survive, and to thrive from 1872, there's something going on here that should be replicated elsewhere. And that's what we do. But I like that standard. Okay, yeah. yeah. The standard yeah. No, that, yeah. of the national. Yeah, yeah right. right. That's, yeah. 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 that's significant. Yeah. Well, while you're thinking, of course, that the one question came up last evening, I just said it's very briefly. The question came up about uh, Bob over. 35 years of the Park Service and another five years in President Obama's administration, 40 years of the interior. And what, what, what kept you motivated? And, uh, and there were two things that really came to my mind. One was to have the privilege and opportunity to work with the finest men and women in the federal government and men and women with the National Park Service. Uh, because you had to have a lot of confidence and be responsible for how they operated the park. If they had American Samoa, Guam, Alaska, you have to feel comfortable that they're going to do the right thing. You go out and see it. And the other was uh, seeing the growth of the national park system. When I first came in and dawned the green gray, I was dating myself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know many of you said, I knew it was old. Right? <laughs> uh, 60 years ago this month, I entered the first national park ever to dawn the green gray, which is the color of the uniform. There were only two areas, two areas in the park system at that time that had been authorized by Congress to commemorate specifically the contributions of African Americans, two African Americans in this sense. It was Booker T. Washington's birthplace on a plantation in, uh, in Virginia, and the birthplace on a plantation of George Washington Carver. And uh, Booker T. came in uh, in uh, 56, George Washington Carver in 43, and then in 1960, uh, President Eisenhower signed legislation authorizing the uh, National Council of Big Women to construct a memorial to Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune on Park Land in the nation's capital. Not only the first memorial of a woman, African American woman on Park Land, but the first memorial to a woman ever in the nation's capital. But because of the uh, requirement that the council and Dr. Heist's leadership had to raise funds for the design and construction. That memorial was not dedicated to 1974. 
but something also happened in 1962, 60 years ago, uh, is that on September 5, uh, President John F. Kennedy signed a bill into law, uh, making the home of Frederick Douglass, by all time you know, a unit uh, of the National Park System. And, uh, his spirit burns deeply within me. And today, there are over almost 40 areas that speak specifically to African Americans or events associated with African Americans, such as Tuskegee Airmen, and Rock Central High School, Brown Horse Education. Uh, but proud, but proud, uh, the founder of a song, uh, Home, is carried for perpetually by the National Park Service as the Carter G. Woodson Home National Historic Site. And of course, President Obama dedicated the memorial on the National Mall in honor of Dr. King. And there will be others added, there will be others added. Uh, but that can be motivated that uh, our history is now being preserved perpetually by the federal government, not only for the benefit of this, uh, but indeed future generations. And I would look to you individually collectively to continue to advocate, tell us more and preserve more of our rich, our rich and enduring African American legacy. So I just want to applaud the people who are doing it. Thank you. I think we have just decided that. Naomi, I know you had a question. And I'll be brief. Sir, it's so good to see you here. How are Thank you? Thank you. I think the last time we saw each other, we were in Charlottesville. Ah, yeah, the good memory, you're right. There's no conference on the interpretation of slavery. That's correct. How important is it for this part to interpret emancipation and the meaning of emancipation? And I say that because I had a white friend of mine to ask me, what is emancipation? This is an educated one. What is emancipation? So how important is it for us to interpret emancipation? And I just want to say that the legislation for the Emancipation of National Historic Trail is written specifically to interpret those 2,000, perhaps, persons who were in Galveston at the time of okay. the announcement that's 2,000 from, two, from 300,000. So that's if right. we can interpret that 2,000, that's a good thing. But we also need some kind of platform to interpret the other 298,000 who were emancipated. Excellent question. Um, my view is, probably professionally and personally, that to really discuss the substance and the meaning of emancipation, it has to be discussed in the context, in the broader context of a document that was ratified 1778, I believe, that had been amended for 27 times. Oh. You, you can't talk about emancipation until you talk about the Constitution of the United States. And, and, and our young people need to understand, need to understand. And, uh, and, and, and also, you know, we talked about some of the practical aspects. What was the motivation of President Lincoln to, to issue the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1, 1863? Uh, what was the meaning of slavery in the context of the Civil War? Uh, the whole concept of freedom, of, uh, of uh, freely enslaved folks. Uh, so you just can't talk about uh, General Granger coming ashore there in Galveston and issuing a document, and then we start moving. Uh, to, uh, from Galveston to Houston. You got to look at how this government operated for its people. And, and recognizing that, uh, uh, that, that, that once the Emancipation Proclamation took place, uh, there was no 14th Amendment. They were not citizens. Uh, they were not, well, how many want to stay here for breakfast in the morning? <laughs> 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 there, there was no, no the exact word is equal protection of the laws. They didn't have that. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, they were not free to a large degree other than what President Lincoln said. There was not the ratification of the 13th Amendment. And uh, there was, what, one or two, I think two, one, border state uh, that uh, they were not uh, 
in, uh, in conflict with the union, and therefore the Emancipation Proclamation did not apply. So you had, uh, I think, 400 uh, enslaved persons in Delaware, and the only time that they became, became free was with the ratification of the 13th Amendment. People need to understand the full dimension of what we're talking about when we say the Emancipation Proclamation, and that's a story. And, and it will motivate our young people to understand the struggle, the sacrifice of made, and that 14th Amendment did not come free. You know, there was 200 African Americans who joined the Union forces to fight for that. And sometimes we sort of, oh gosh, sometimes we sort of turn our eye to, to the Civil War. And I think it, is, it, it, it dishonors the 200,000 men fought in the Civil War, African Americans. They were given their all, they were given all for that thing called freedom. We need to recognize and be honest with ourselves. Yeah. Thank you for the question. <laughs> <laughs> as it was emerging, but not at the pace of, uh, of what's occurring today. And again, I just use Washington, D.C. As, as a reference point. Uh, uh, let's take the, the Shaw community right down the street from Howard. There's a memorial there that honors the 200 plus African Americans in the Civil War. The names are inscribed on the, uh, on the memorial. And then in Anacostia, the, the home of Frederick Douglass, it's changing too, even to change at a more rapid pace. So the question is, do the new residents, if you will, of those areas, having an understanding and appreciation of the richness of those neighborhoods or communities? Or are there different interests that they may have? And uh, I just don't know. I, okay. I just don't know. I, uh, I guess older I get, maybe more I get agitated or irritated. Um, I, Dr. Bethune's memorial means a great deal to me. And uh, it's located within, what, three blocks, four blocks from the Capitol. Neighbor, beautiful neighborhood. And uh, heavily used uh, for strolling the babies, certainly walking the dogs. And I was in some discussion, and I mentioned about uh, Oh, 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 yes, see that thing occasionally. And that sort of <laughs> irritated me that they didn't know about that resource in their own community and maybe a new residents. So they had to be more outreached by the park service. So, so I, 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 I don't have an answer to it. Uh, but I am comforted by the fact that you young people want to address us all the problems. I just sit back and think about it. <laughs> but, but it's reality. That yes, is sir. definitely been one of the challenges yes. for this site. It, it because is. When, when this was redone, it was described as an emancipation park for white people. And that was, the, that was the description because of how the neighborhood is yeah. defined and changing. Uh -huh. So that, that is an ongoing discussion that really has to be handled through programming. Yeah. And that, that's a significant okay. part of the park's role and the, the city's role as a park to make sure uh -huh. that program is the yes. what um, what would be just this particular uh, site but to treat it as the potential tourist site the potential educational and research site that yeah. it really should be and so that, oh, okay that's that's a program yes right was that a question yeah. sir yes sir yes thank you uh, I'm Charles Cook and I, I'm involved with the historic cemetery here in Houston cemetery yes sir uh -huh. cemetery 
and it was founded by 1875, but when I came upon it almost 30 years ago, it was just completely overgrown. And it What's was, the name of the cemetery? Uh, Hollywood Cemetery. It's just, uh, just north of Freedman's Town, just north of Fort Worth. Okay. And uh, anyway, uh, I would like to know what is the National Park Service role in maybe some cemeteries, or are there any cemeteries that in your jurisdiction? Okay, appreciate, appreciate that question. There is a bill, I think it's still active or maybe it reintroduced, uh, that would establish responsibility for the National Park Service to provide the financial and technical assistance in, first of all, inventory, documenting, and then preserving uh, historic African American cemeteries uh, that could be in public jurisdiction or private jurisdiction. That bill, uh, I think, is still in the process of being committed. It's not been voted out. Uh, but the park says cannot unilaterally establish new programs. And what happens when Congress establish a program, then it's up to the park service to design strategies, plan what have in terms of implementing the letter of the spirit. And, uh, and it, it may be uh, something similar to the Underground Railroad Network of Freedom, which Congress authorized in 1998. Uh, that, it, that the Park Service work cooperatively with uh, private individual organizations, state government, organizations such as the SAR, uh, in, 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 in giving funding, giving technical assistance to research in those places that may have been uh, where our ancestors hid you know, on the Underground Railroad. And here in Texas, people went south as opposed to north, but into Mexico as an example. My sense is, based on my discussion with some people in recent times, is that that bill will be enacted. What the particulars, I don't know. Now, if, if the cemetery that you reference, uh, it, did it receive some financial assistance from uh, National Trust of Historic Preservation? Yes, yes. Right, I'm a member of that council, along with <coughs> Mrs. Uh, Rashad, and, and, and she's the co-chair of the, uh, the council. Uh, so, 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 yeah, so there's, private organizations that raise money and, and assist uh, in, in those kind of noble endeavors of cemetery. But I think there's going to be a large federal focus to give in the system. Now, there is one cemetery that is under the jurisdiction of the Park Service in uh, New York. It's called the African Barrel National Monument, uh, which came about through a large government uh, a building project. And when the excavation, it came across all the remains decision made that they should be honored and married. So the Park Service is, by law, has a responsibility to care for that. Uh, so I, I'm optimistic that there'll be more young. And there That's are a large number of That's certainly good. Yes. Yeah. Because this, I mean, I, you know the work that you've done with Olive Wood and that um, many organizations that have reached out and yeah. tried to help with Olive Wood. And it's, it's just a wealth of history. Yeah, no question right about that. It is. Of those it is. Yeah. And there has been encroachment by adjacent developers, yeah. and I'm convinced encroachment by a particular corporation uh, that impacted uh, the boundary of our wood. And so that's that's something that really needs to be yeah, uh, addressed. And with, it. with the uh, that opportunity, that would be a great opportunity. Yes. Thanks. Thanks. Other questions? I know we're we're like over time, but. Yes. Before I came to the African American Library in the Gregory School, I was the processing archivist at the National at the NOK National Historic Site. Yes. And so that was my introduction in a professional sense to the National Park Service. Okay. One of the first entities that I came across was an organization called Bringing Youth, which was to introduce young people to oh, yes. preservation and that kind of thing. And so my question is a little bit different from what we talked about tonight, but in terms of professionalization in National Park Service, professionalization of our youth in preservation. What are your thoughts on that? And is there you know, something that we can do as preservation professionals to kind of encourage um, both, you know, our youth to get involved in these kinds of careers? Okay, appreciate it very much. She's speaking of a uh, organization founded and managed by a uh, uh, husband and wife team called Winnie Youth Foundation and they really encourage you to reach out for uh, young people in college, university, 
uh, to uh, experience uh, the preservation of the natural cultural heritage. And some of the uh, young people eventually changed their uh, majors, if you will, to go into uh, this uh, noble effort. So, uh, and I want to thank you for your contribution to MLK. What is so interesting, and I think she perhaps sensed uh, what is a, a passion, I hope that each of us share, uh, is the engagement, the engagement of our young people uh, in preserving our uh, heritage. And, uh, and I just think that needs to be more. I have spoken with uh, Mohammed uh, about uh, the outreach efforts here beyond you know, the recreational pursuit, which I'm certain uh, is a credit to contributing to our wellness and what have you, but also there's that uh, intellectual and educational components. And uh, I uh, consider the uh, <laughs> quotation junkie. Uh, and uh, I just would suggest to you uh, the last will and testament. Describe in own words, Dr. Member Cobb, in the year of death, 1955. And uh, for my closing comments, and I'm still your comment, because you have the last closing comment, oh. I'm just, I'm just <laughs> so that's leave, not <laughs> leave you the, uh, the wisdom of uh, Dr. Member Cloud. Uh, and I like the inscription on the memorial, uh, which is. Uh, it's a lesson to all of us, and I think it's drawn, pastor, by the Lord from the scripture. It simply states, let it work, praise him. So I think that's a question to all of us. What will our work say about us? But in her last will and testament, um, she, uh, she stated this, I leave you finally, I leave you finally, a responsibility Young the world around us really belongs to the youth, for youth will take over its future management. Our children must never, never lose their zeal for building a better world. They must, they must not be discouraged from aspiring towards greatness, for they are to be the leaders of tomorrow. So my judgment is that we have our individual collective responsibility and always, to the extent possible, to engage our youth. That should be our collective and individual responsibility. And I think that's so well demonstrated here at the administration part. But let's continue, continue to increase the engagement of our young people. Thank you so much. I apologize.
really of his time and of his own dime in some cases, traveled with us to ensure that we got the word out and we were able to, to raise those funds. So that's one example. Uh, example number two uh, has to do with those 40 plus African American cultural sites that are part of the national park system right now. Bob's being very, 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 very humble because a great deal of those parks that represent our history and culture would not be in the system and would not be possible if it wasn't for his leadership. Come visit with me on the East Coast. <laughs> Thank you very much. 